Thank you, Hans, uh, uh, for the kind invitation to talk uh, for today's uh, conference. I've been asked by Hans to talk about can Australia feed uh, Asia. In fact, uh, Hans asked me to talk about can Western Australia feed Asia. So I took the liberty to um, use whole Australia as the um, as the topic. The outline of my presentation, I think uh, before we answering that question, it's important that uh, I talk about the global population and agricultural protection and also the food and the feed demand globally, because ultimately uh, we have to look at uh, other parts of the world for exporting our food. And we need to know what is the current Australian agricultural production? What is the trend for the next uh, 10, 20, 30, and even in fact, 40 years? What is our uh, agriculture export status? And what are the potential opportunities in the food industry for um, exporting and also feeding our own population. And then I will draw the conclusion. So the world population, um, year on year population change uh, is uh, shown on the left hand side of my left hand side and the annual population growth is uh, showing on the right hand side. So projected for 2031 period. So you can see that uh, in all cases, uh, all regions, there will be declining the population growth rate, but our base is still high, so that we will still have about nine to 9.5 billion people on the planet by 2050, especially places like Sub-Saharan Africa, and the growth is uh, clearly happening, and uh, India, although China will slow down. Now, if you look at the source of crop growth uh, production 2022 to 2031, we'll see that uh, the growth in land use is going to be limited. Uh, only place where there will be some growth, uh, Europe and Central Asia, and also to some extent in North America and Latin America. Uh, the growth uh, in multi-crop land, that's more than one crop, is also looking not that high. Uh, growth in yield is the main way to go. But we all know that the major crops like rice, wheat, maize, there has been plateauing of the yield improvement in recent years. So there is a challenge, but still the growth has to come from the growth in yield. And if you look at the uh, trends in global agricultural production, uh, on the left-hand side, it is uh, in US dollars in billion, and on the right-hand axis uh, is the growth in production from 2019 to 20. Uh, 31. So we'll see that uh, places like India and China still continue to grow, um, mainly the crops, but also we are going to see uh, growth in livestock production, particularly in Latin America and uh, some of the European uh, countries. And if you look at the um, global use of major commodities, we'll see that um, May's uh, majority of the use uh, by 2031 still will continue to be in the feed sector. And in the food sector, uh, grains like rice and wheat will still dominate. Um, oil seed and other products will contribute to the feed sector. And uh, biofuel is still uh, smaller, but a significant proportion, particularly in the case of uh, maize. Then what is the demand, annual growth in demand for key commodity groups? So this is due to two reasons. One is due to per capita demand growth, that is food and other uses. And the other one is uh, simply the population growth occurs, so hence the demand grows. So if you look at the figure for 2031 from 2022, majority of the growth will occur due to um, the population um, growth, but also there is some demand growth happening. Significant amount of demand will happen in most sectors, particularly in the case of uh, uh, vegetables, dairy products, and, and the fish. The per capita income is also increasing um, everywhere. 
particularly um, in China, and there's a, a less extent in India, but Oceania, uh, North America, and Europe, there will be increase. Uh, unfortunately, Sub-Saharan Africa, there's not going to be major increase, uh, similar in the case of uh, uh, Southeast Asia. And if you look at the regional contribution to food demand growth, again, 2012, 2021, and 2022-31 period, there will be significant demand of cereals from sub-Saharan Africa, and then meat, uh, particularly in China, and also fish uh, products into China. In India, the dairy uh, products uh, will be in great demand, being a vegetarian country, and there will be some demand for vegetable oils. The change in agricultural land use, uh, we are not going to see significant increase in um, uh, land use. Uh, the increase will be mostly uh, in the case of crop, crop land, Asia Pacific, and also we will see some increase in crop land area in Latin America. In all other cases, uh, there will be reduction uh, in uh, agricultural land use for crop. So with that background, let's look at what Australia can do. Australia has got all kinds of uh, climate, equatorial on the top. Uh, then we also have a tropical, that uh, green bit. Then the subtropical and large part of Australia is uh, arid and uh, dry desert. Then we also have grassland area or rangelands and temperate regions. So the summary is that Australia has all kinds of climate. Um, and so that we can produce a uh, number of products at different parts of Australia. But also, it is the driest human inhabited continent in the world. Uh, this is a very interesting map. Uh, it's an analog map shows how Australia's uh, climate zones compared to those of uh, other cities and countries around the world. For example, southwest of Western Australia is uh, more like Southern California uh, and parts of Mexico and so on. The northern part of Australia is more like uh, India. And then we have um, Sonora Desert, Sahara, and similar kind of uh, a very arid uh, desert situation. We also have very temperate uh, um, country uh, regions, similar to Buenos Aires and uh, San Francisco. But uh, coming to the agricultural production zones, uh, people think that uh, Australia is a large continent and we have plenty of land for agricultural production. Unfortunately, the previous map shows that uh, not much of uh, land can be used. So if you look at the uh, grazing vegetation and native vegetation grazing, that's about uh, 283 million hectares. That's largely the rangelands. The grazing land modified with some sown pastures is about 41 million hectares. And pe people think that cropping is large. It is not very large. It's about 21 million hectares, which includes cropping, uh, pastures, and rotation. The horticulture industry is very small, about 0.46 uh, million hectares. So the grain belt of West uh, Australia is uh, that um, area which shows about 300 to 600 millimeter rainfall iso heights that's in yellow so again a small area uh, largely depending upon rainfall uh, pretty much vulnerable to climate change so if you look at the agriculture fisheries and forestry value of production by commodity uh, the 2020 21 figure so the livestock that includes cattle, sheep, milk, poultry, wool, pigs, etc., contribute about 42 percentage. The cropping is about 34 percentage, and then fruit, nuts, vegetables, and other horticulture is about 16 percentage. Forestry and fisheries is seven percentage. Agriculture, fishery, and forestry production, um, 2001 to say 2021 period, we have been seeing the 20 years, uh, a nine percentage increase in production of the livestock, meat, li um, live animals, et cetera. Uh, grains about three percentage increase. And uh, in the case of fruits and vegetable horticulture industry, a massive increase of 16 percentage and a drop of eight percentage in the case of uh, forestry and fisheries. The exports also varied 
but the significant growth seeing in the case of fruits, vegetables, and other horticulture crops. Uh, that's a reflection of the demand coming from um, countries in our region. So in nutshell, Australia export about 72 percentage of the agricultural production is exported. In some cases, it is very high. For example, sugar, it is 84 percentage, beef and veal 78, and mutton and lamb 78. Canola is 65 percentage, and in the case of wheat, 67, and rice, majority of rice is exported whenever we can produce. And the case of dairy and fruits and nuts, etc., less but still significant proportion. Pig and poultry, we only export 6 percentage, the rest is consumed domestically. Wine industry is an excellent example. Um, the overall Australian wine export increased by um, 4 percentage uh, in the 2018-19 year and reached about 2.8 billion. Since then we had the impact of COVID, but still it is around that 2.8 to 3 billion dollars worth. China still represent the biggest growth area, although there has been some, some temporary hiccups, but it'll, it will be over uh, in, in the next couple of years time. And the value for um, US is also increasing and uh, it provides a potential opportunity to export high value um, wine to that market. So 63% of the wine produced is exported and there are about 2,729 wine exporters in Australia, and that's equivalent to 20.5 million glasses of Australian wine enjoyed overseas. So it's a very large um, industry exported to uh, overseas, and Asia, particularly China, is dominating, although appetite is increasing from countries like India. And there's a different range of products, about 24, 25,000, uh, products are exported. This is the only uh, graph I'll show about Western Australia. So it's again a very interesting story. Um, you can see from 2000, uh, we produced about uh, say seven to eight million tons of grains. And uh, last year we had uh, um, about 24 million tons. And this year the prediction is uh, it will cross over 20 million, probably in the vicinity of 20 to 23 million. Uh, and who knows, it could even be as high as 24 million. The circles are shows where we had some very uh, drought years. The other interesting data is that uh, we have diversified. If you look at the data from 1991 to 94, 95, we were about 3 billion uh, is the value of our grains industry and largely dominated by wheat as opposed to 2017, 2018 period, the export has been about, the, the total value has been about 12, billion dollars and you can see the wheat uh, contracted still it is the dominant crop but you can see crops like canola barley pulses and other crops coming into the picture so if you look at the, the um, period uh, 20 years um, you can see that uh, the cropping uh, is mainly driven by increased value and the price is a uh, uh, driving in the case of uh, livestock. So in other words, the, the volume is driving the crops, grains, and in the case of livestock, uh, the value, the price is really driving. So the, the real value of uh, fisheries uh, and agriculture and fisheries export destinations are shown here. So it's about um, anything between 50 to 60 billion dollars worth uh, and some of the regions like Singapore, Hong Kong, Vietnam uh, and to lesser extent India, of course Korean Republic and Indonesia, Japan and China are dominating. Other countries include New Zealand and the United States. The number and shares of broad acre and livestock farm from say 1979 to 1980 and then you look at uh, 2019, 2020, they number and shares of broad acre um, cropping has uh, farms has declined and whereas the livestock farms has increased. So the total number of farms in Australia uh, in the 1980-81 was about 120,000 farmers, farms, and now it's about uh, just about 60,000 farms. 
And the farm workforce type also has changed, but basically the contract farmers still dominate Australians, contract Australians, working holiday, although that has uh, reduced because of the COVID, then there is a permanent Australians and the family members still constitute a larger proportion. And then we get a smaller number from Pacific Australia labor mobility workforce. If you look at the shares of broad acre farm population, the farm with the receipts uh, greater than 1 million has increased uh, since 1978-79. If you look at the figures in 2019-20, and the farms with the receipts between 200K and 1 million also has increased. So basically we are seeing shares of total area operated uh, with the farm receipts greater than 1 million is really dominating. So the farmers uh, increase their um, size of the uh, profit. So that's uh, again uh, reflected here. The farms with receipts greater than 1 million, that's the revenue, um, has increased substantially uh, since 1978-79. And the farms with receipts greater than 1 million, the shares of the total output also has increased in the 2019-2020 period. The total factor productivity uh, farmers' terms of trade is an interesting story. For a long period of time, it has been declining, but uh, with the climate adjusted, total factor productivity shows a positive trend. A lot of that is driven largely by, of course, e efficiency, but also increased price of the commodities we are experiencing in the international markets. Another interesting thing is that our farmers are pretty good. The farm business debt, um, although it is still there, it is pretty low. Um, the equity for the business owners is very high. And the ratio of, uh, uh, of that is uh, pretty good. That the equity ratio is, has been stabilized uh, over 5.5. 5, 5. The other interesting story is um, Australia is uh, one of the least subsidized countries. If you look at uh, Norway, Korea, Philippines, United Kingdom, all those places, uh, there is significant subsidy going on. And uh, whereas places like Argentina, India, and Vietnam, there is even more uh, subsidies going on as a, as a factor. Australia's food and agriculture opportunity could be worth uh, over 200 billion by 2030. So if you look at the figure in 2019, it is 125 million, but uh, there is a tremendous potential for growth and we could reach as high as 201 billion by 2030 in various areas. I will not go into the details, health and wellness, traditional protein, supply chain transformation, and so on. But the total economic impact is uh, even bigger um, in Australian dollars in 2019 dollars, high estimate. So for example, the direct benefit will be about 245 billion. That is direct increase in sales of fresh fruits, vegetable for retailers like supermarkets. Indirect effect is about 152 billion. That is the economic impact uh, on suppliers involved in supplying the fruits. Example, Costa Group and packaging. The consumption induced also can increase. 151 billion. So we could be looking about 548 billion um, impact associated with the food and agribusiness opportunities in Australia. Job, there is a, a, enormous potential for improvement in growth job opportunity. For example, 2019, about 542,081 people were employed. Um, the potential opportunity by 2030 with an estimate is uh, looking 842 million people. Again, I'll not go into the details, where are the opportunities, but number of opportunities exist. The key opportunities in Australian industry, shifting trends, uh, the 10 trends will significantly shape uh, in the industry. Um, that's 164 million people projected to join the consumer class, particularly in the uh, middle income in the Asian countries. And also a rising food security concern following the COVID-19 pandemic, people will be more interested in buying food, particularly countries like Singapore, um, um, Middle East, uh, UAE, and other countries where they cannot produce uh, sufficient food. 
large new markets uh, we can create uh, using some of the technologies, uh, Internet of Things, advanced genomics, transform how food is produced, how it is distributed, food supply chain, and also finally how it reaches to the plate. So there's a big opportunity there. There's also big value, value ahead. For example, 200 billion value added in 2030, which would almost triple the current size of Australian food and agribusiness. More jobs, I already mentioned, uh, we could reach up to 842,000 potential jobs. That's a pretty big um, uh, uh, growth rate. There will be um, shift in skills required. So we need a different type of uh, um, job, uh, people for the job. That will depend upon technical, managerial, and uh, num numeracy skills, and also administrative uh, workers, etc. So we need to train them. Some of the research and development areas, we need to look at the food security and sustainability that's protecting Australia's economy, environment, people from climate change, pest and disease through improved integrity, traceability, and so on. Enhance the production value addition, better genetics, novel technologies, processing techno techniques, um, minimize food waste, and also produce highly differentiated and value-added products. This is what consumers need. The global marketplace, I think we need to really connect with the emerging middle class in Asia, much more education, what Australia can supply with the global value chains. This will provide new markets into the uh, needs of future consumers. Uh, future consumer uh, feeding the growing and aging population with the functional and nutritional foods that within Australia and personalized to their taste and health and lifestyle preferences. That will also happen in some of the high income Asian countries. Can Australia feed Asia or can Australia be the Asian football? I think we need to understand that Australia is a major agriculture exporting nation, uh, top 10 nation in the world and net, ex net exporter of agricultural products that is export minus import. But we also export a lot of uh, non-food items, for example, wool, cotton, hide, skin and animal feed. So the Australian agriculture currently feeds uh, 26 million people, that's uh, at home, and about roughly 50 million overseas. So that's the actual population we feed. So about 76, 80 million people. But the interesting thing is that each of uh, Australia's 135,000 farmers annually produce uh, food for 200 people at home and about 550 people overseas. Not a bad effort. The 122 billion Australian food, uh, beverage and grocery manufacturing sector is the biggest manufacturing sector with about 273,000 jobs and is backbone to regional Australia. So we must remember agriculture is important. It's not just all about mining and digging uh, and sometimes we forget about the uh, total value of the agricultural industry, what it does to the whole economy and whole population here. The gross uh, value of production from the 135,000 farm varies between, depending upon the season, 55 billion to 68 and uh, close to 70 billion. The federal government, previous government, has pre predicted or projected for a 100 billion industry by um, 2030. The export account for anything between 45 billion to about 50 billion. And also more importantly, one in uh, seven Australian jobs, that's about 1.6 million, are in the farm dependent economy, food and beverage processing sector. And one third of all Australian manufacturing workers with a huge growth potential, as I previously mentioned. Australian population 2061 projected to be, let's say, 37 million and about 48 million, somewhere in between. Can we feed them? I think with the current food we produce or projected food, we can, but then we don't have quite a lot left for export. But in order to feed us uh, in the future, 2061, and make some export as well, we need to combat climate change, the degradation of our natural resources including soil, and also we have competition for land and water use from 
mining and urban, urban expansion. So the conclusion, um, Australia is and will not be the football of Asia. That's very clear. Australia can feed many more people than we currently do. So we don't need to be worried about our population growth within Australia uh, until 2050, 2060. But we must make sure that our food system is healthy, sustainable, and fair. One possibility is that, which is already happening, but we could strengthen exporting the research and development technology and education, both vocational, higher education, that underpin our future food system will benefit far more people. So it could be as high as 500 million people. So it's not the um, 50, 60 million people we're talking about, it's 500 million people than those directly consuming food produced in Australia. So I'm happy to say that Australia is and will not be the football. We will be supplying high quality products to uh, the middle class and upper middle class in Asia and other countries. And we need to get the return on that. But we also have got a hard job here to look after uh, some of our natural resources, uh, climate change, both adaptation and mitigation. But our brain power, our R&D technology can help us to feed more people uh, or help them to feed themselves uh, in countries in our region. Thank you.